So welcome guys to our Accelerate session, easily one of my favorite uh, sessions every month where we get to interview a uh, successful gym owner and ask them what's working and what sort of things have they trialed in the past that maybe didn't work so well. And the, the, the goal I think is just to find little shortcuts. Um, obviously all of us are, are gym owners or gym managers that have logged in and there's um, yeah, so much about our, our model which is similar to the other people that have logged in as well as our guests today. So I really want to encourage you to use this time well today. Look for little things that you might be able to take away and apply to your gym. Um, I want to do a special welcome to our guest who is Cameron Hoban. Welcome to the call, Cameron. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for having me along. Hey, um, Cameron and I actually went to university together, so we did um, PE teaching. Um, and Cameron's been a, a gym owner for many years. Um, tell us a bit about the, the gym uh, that you owned and how long you had that for. Yeah, the, the gym I owned um, started specifically as a personal training studio. Uh, that's, that's how we opened up. Um, and that was in two, end of 2003. So the business, uh, which I recently sold after 17 years, so it's going into its 18th year now in existence. Um, yeah, the business model has evolved a little bit over the time. As I said, it started primarily as a personal training studio, um, but over time that evolved and, and now it's probably, I guess, best described as a, uh, a boutique gym, um, which has a special focus on personal training and group training. Sure. And like, give us a bit of insight. Um, none of us obviously based down at, at Cronulla in, in the south of Sydney there. But um, like when you say boutique, what, what are you charging for gym memberships if someone wants to come in and do gym and, or classes and stuff? Yeah, I guess when I, when I say boutique, I'm probably more referring to the service aspect of it um, sure. and, and probably the size aspect as opposed to, to the fees. Okay. Um, you know, fees wise, I think, uh, from from where I left, it was the PT was around eighty dollars um, an hour for an hour session. Yeah, uh, the half hour sessions were were fifty dollars an hour, and yep. uh, they we did a two on one session that was about one hundred hundred and fifteen dollars an hour. Okay. Then, yeah. And what about like gym access? If if I wanted to be a gym member. Yeah. So we we sort of ended up going down that path probably about midway through my tenure um, as the business evolved and sort of changed, uh, pivoted a little bit. So in the end, yeah, we offered a, a range of different membership packages and, and the prices probably ranged anywhere from $50 up to about 80 something dollars uh, for, for your monthly direct debit. Um, yep. The reason for the, the differential in the price was that um, it, it, we, we aim to reward people that were doing weekly personal training and keep them engaged in what we considered to be our premier service, which was the PT. So yep. those, that, those that were doing regular weekly PT with a personal trainer actually could take up a membership at a discounted rate. And we had a sure. package for that, that you could come and get gym access and class access, access like with most um, traditional gym memberships without the obligation of PT and you just pay the the full rate of $80 a month for that. Yeah, very good. And for guys, you probably heard me sort of mention the gym you did own. Um, Cameron had it for 17 years and actually sold it last year. Um, and because his plans of sort of moving to Italy have been postponed with COVID, um, he's still sort of working inside the, the gym at the moment for the, for the new owner. Um, yeah, part of it as part of like an agreement as a handover, but also without anywhere like urgently to move to you're still in there so um yeah we'll, we'll touch on the sales sort of aspect a little bit later but um yeah this is obviously a business that you know sort of intimately yeah. um what what type of classes were you offering in there um well we had a, we had a pretty good range by the end i think we had a timetable again for, for a gym of our size up to about 30 classes so sure. we had um pilates we had uh, uh, we had uh, spin and so indoor cycle classes. Um, we had a circuit class and we also created a class of our own, which was called uh, Spin Lardis, which is basically a combination of hit spin followed by Pilates. And that, that actually became quite popular. Yeah, that's interesting. It's... Um... Oh, and and run, groups. run groups, which was... Yeah, our group training actually started with run groups. It was it was when we were 
first a, a, um, a personal training gym, we added a couple of run groups because a lot of our core clients uh, were interested in running and it was just a way of us to get together in a social context and have a run together. It was basically just a value add. Um, yep. and, then, and then it sort of grew from there and became a regular part of our group training timetable. So it's good. It's so um, charging members um, anywhere from sort of 50 to $80 a month to use the gym, 30 classes a week with a variety of things. It's interesting what you said about the classes, um, the, the hybrid one. Mm. Um, spin and Pilates so we, we do like a boxing and a run group at the moment um, and effectively it just enables us to have twice as many people there because we sort of have two two groups yeah. but we yeah. just found that not everyone could run for an hour or wanted to run for an hour they're yeah. sort of scared by it so a little bit of both has been popular yeah well similar to how the, the spin Pilates was born that um, a lot of people I find get bored on bikes for a full 50 minute spin class there was people that like to come in um, and doing you know, high intensity for 20 or 30 minutes, but also like to have a stretch and some mobility at the end of the session as well. So this was a way for those people, those time poor people to um, to tick those boxes. Yeah, sure. Um, for those that haven't been to your facility, um, you've actually got like a pool in the complex and stuff as well. How did you sort of, um, yeah, how do you manage like a pool and, a, and a, a retail place where you can get a coffee and ice blocks and stuff like that? Yeah, you're right. So it's a, it's a two level complex and the bottom level has two pools in it, a 25 metre uh, lap swimming pool and a 15 metre sort of uh, young child learn to swim pool. Um, look, when I first went in there, I went in there because I liked the location and I saw the potential for the gym mainly. Um, you know, the swimming side of things was never my passion, but I took it on with the intention of maybe building it up a little bit and then um, subletting it out and having a passive income from that, which is which is how it all unfolded. So I probably ran it for um, around three to four years. And then after that time, I put it out to tender and actually got a tenant in who just basically paid me a leasing fee. But I maintain rights for my members to use the pool as a part of their memberships. Um, reality is that not, not many do. Um, but, um, and then, yeah, we've got a, a retail stock uh, shop at the front because we're on a, a reasonably busy promenade there. It was just an opportunity for another revenue source. And so we sell supplement and, and nutritional supplements uh, training-wise out of that, but also a few things to the general public. So, yeah, it was, it was yeah, pretty full-on in the early days when I was managing both areas. But, um, you know, the, the plan to focus in on the fitness side of things, uh, it worked out really well. And then... We, uh, we tend to generate a little bit of business from the Learn to Swim and, and Swimming program as well. So it works quite well. Yeah, I, I love that idea of, um, you know, subleasing the pool. Um, not only do you get sort of contest, uh, consistent rent from someone, but it's a little less for you to sort of focus on because it's a pretty big engine oh, yeah. if you're running all those different parts. Yeah. Um, yeah. I also like, you know, if you're selling drinks and ice blocks and stuff and you've got a little retail part, you've got so many people going past to sort of buy stuff who mm -hmm. are going in and out of the pool. They probably sort of see the gym option, even if they just came to bring their kids to the pool or something. Yeah, it draws, definitely draws a few people in having a shop. You know, if people want to drop in for a, for a water or a coffee or a drink and then they notice what else we have on offer that they otherwise wouldn't. So, yeah, we've definitely generated some um, some new business out of that. It's good. I know for a lot of the guys that have logged in, there's not necessarily an option for a pool, but for some of you, you've got additional space. There's opportunities to rent it out to a, a physiotherapist or a massage therapist. There's, a, there's an opportunity for a little cafe or potentially renting space to a cafe where you don't have to run it yourself. So I love that you've sort of been able to share that as an example. Um, give us a bit of an insight as to like the number of members training in the gym and how much PT were you doing when you sort of sold the business last year? Yeah, sure. So the, the PT numbers, we're doing about three, 300 to 350 appointments a week of PT. Yep. Um, and at the same time, we had around about 400 to 420 um, gym memberships at that time. Yeah, perfect. Um, and like one of the things I've always envied that you've done really, really well is retention of staff. Um, give, it, give the guys an example, like some of your staff that have stayed, oh, yeah. like how long okay. have you been able to retain trainers for? 
Yeah, um, yeah, that has been one of the, one of the um, the really satisfying things uh, in my business life is to be, and it's obviously aided the business to have that stability. Um, I've had four trainers that have been that have served the business for over ten years. Two of them were around thirteen years, um, and then one's around the twelve year mark, and one's just tipped over the 10, 10 year mark. So, uh, yeah. and we've had a range of other ones that have sort of got up around that six seven year mark as well. It's um it's magic. Like I know one of the biggest challenges we face in the fitness industry is like any small business is is staffing issues. Um obviously it, it helps if you can keep someone in there instead of having to retrain them every six months, they sort of acquire skills and then if anything, they can probably take more roles and responsibilities and stuff on. Yeah. Um what do you what do you think has enabled you to keep staff for, for that sort of length of time when other gyms might struggle to keep them for six months? Um, I, I, I think I've always been very conscious and motivated and understood the importance of having staff as long as you can keep them, knowing that it's not always going to work out. But I think one of my key focus points has been helping them build an income that is sustainable for them in their lifestyle. Um, I think amongst a few reasons why trainers might drop out or you know move on from from your organization but maybe move out of move out of the industry is that they they're unable to get their income to a to a, a satisfactory level for their lifestyle mm -hmm. um, so i've always been conscious that if in a reasonable time frame you can't get them to a level of income that's um that's going to sustain their lifestyle then that's one of the reasons they would move on I think the other thing that I've always tried to, to create is a, um, a comfortable atmosphere and, and a good team environment that they actually enjoy coming to work. Um, and that, you know, there's, there's obviously a range of things that facilitate that um, in terms of the culture that you drive, but, you know, social occasions, the way that the clients integrate, um, you know, staff, staff bonding sessions, all of those things are quite important and, and, you know, the way that, that you as a leader um, treat them and the way that your senior staff treat treat junior staff, I think has always been important. And probably the last thing is helping them, um, I guess, develop a, a roster or working hours that are also a little bit more sustainable. I think we know that um, the life of a, uh, of a person in fitness can often mean a lot of early mornings and, and evenings. And, um, you know, from day one, I've tried to give them a pathway where, you know, they're not going to be working four or five early mornings or four and, and four, four or five nights on the same week. So yeah. I try and work with them to, to shape a, a schedule that is, that is sustainable instead of, um, you know, letting them do, you know, shifts of five in the morning till 11, come back at four and do till late 30 at night, five days a week, and then Saturday morning, knowing that that's probably not going to last very long. Yeah, there's, there's so many little nuggets there. Um, helping them get to an income that supports their lifestyle because it's not it's not cheap um, to to live in Cronulla and um, what do you think is a realistic time frame? Like, do you sort of allow yourself three months, six months, twelve months? What do you think is kind of that? What do you think is realistic? Or what do you think they expect from you in terms of getting to that point where they they can cover their expenses? Well, I think that's an important discussion in your recruitment. Um, you know, you don't want to recruit someone that is expecting and needs to reach that level of income inside three months and you can't deliver that, uh, then obviously you are on a you are on a losing wicket with that person. So, you know, for me, I think when I'm recruiting, I, I try and get to understand their lifestyle and, and where they're positioned and, and what sort of, you know, um, financial uh, obligations they have and talk to them about, you know, how quickly they need to get to that level. But, you know, I, I try and, uh, you know, give myself six months to get them there and, and make sure. sure and make sure that they're in a position to, you know, to, to build up to that sort of level. Yeah. And I think the other thing that I've probably failed to mention before is the other thing I try and do, and I, I start this from day one when I recruit them, is try to give them a pathway where they can earn income um, other than just directly from, in the case of personal trainers, just one-on-one -on -one PT sessions, or in the yep. case of group training instructors, just group training sessions. Sure. Um, 
they give them other ways to earn an income. It also gives them a little bit of variety in their roles and responsibilities, which keeps them a little bit fresher. Yeah, sure. So if they they come for like a personal training role, you might try and supplement their income with like three group classes with some sales commissions or, or something like that. Yeah, I always try and I always try and open the door for personal trainers to do group training as well. Yep. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it builds their profile in the business and it makes it easier to put new clients with them. Um, mm-hmm. Two, it gives them variety. Three, it gives them more stability because a, a class never cancels on you. Um, able to pay them more for a group training class than for a, for a PT in the initial stages. So I think that has okay. that benefit as well. And then, yeah, extra responsibility. So as your group training timetable grows, um, to get some to get some assistance in maintaining your consistency and quality, you can give some of your best performers some responsibility surrounding the um, the group training timetable and the programming. It's good. It's um, the, the when it comes to sort of PT and and classes, do you are you looking at sort of uh, the number of people that attend a class and sort of paying per, for for like a commission or something or is is group classes just valued at ten dollars more than a PT, or how how did you do that? Yeah, no, it starts it starts with a set rate, which is more. And yeah, you're right; it's probably about ten um, ten dollars more, ten ten fifteen dollars more than say your basic PT one on one. So it yep. starts with that, and then as they go performance reviews, yeah, if they're if they're getting great feedback and and getting good numbers to their classes, then that rate will go up. Yeah, I love that because that's obviously the glue for like every gym is is going to deal with a nutrition rate and people join. And even if you do a good job, they're going to sometimes give you a high five and leave and anything you can do to keep people engaged and actually seeing value in the membership means they're going to stay longer and refer more people. So I love that sort of incentive around people that are doing a better job can, can earn more money. It's good. Yeah. But I'm just going to pause for a second. Um, we've got a whole bunch of people on the call um, guys, we're, we're interviewing Cameron Hoven. He's um, had a, a gym in Cronulla called Elite Personal Training, which was 300 to 350 hours or 300, 300 to 350 PT sessions a week and about 400 uh, gym members per week. He had that for 17 years and sold it last year. And he's still involved in that business as, um, as a bit of a handover period, but also um, because there's not too many options and what he can do uh, at the moment with lockdown. So we've just been sort of uh, finding out a little bit about his business and I'm interested to know what questions you have. So um, David Flanagan, if you have questions for Cameron, go into the chat for me and tell me what you'd like to ask. Um, Rick's joining us from Element Fitness. We've got about 1,300 members down there in Victoria that uh, reopened today, well done. Uh, Scott's in at Challenge Fitness in Port Macquarie. Uh, We've got Nath that's got a, a vision personal training in Engadine, so not far from you in, in Cronulla. Um, Nath mentioned this morning that you guys have met or sat next to each other in one of our events many years ago. Okay, yeah, uh, I, do, I do remember that, yeah. Uh, Lily is from Six Degrees South, so she's got a um, uh, kind of all services gym, a little bit like a, your, your one uh, in, in Victoria. Guys, go into the chat for me if you have a question. Uh, I'd love you to put it into the chat and I will ask Cameron. Um, while I'm waiting, there's a couple of other things that you sort of mentioned. You said that one of the things you do that contributes to trainers like staying on is uh, like socials. Mm-hmm. Um, my mum and dad still live in Miranda, not far from your uh, gym. And I remember going and running the uh, Sutherland to surf. Not, not very fast, mind you, but uh, <laughs> I, I ran it and I remember seeing all the shirts. So like all your guys are there in singlets or t-shirts um big sort of marquee at the end it was quite yeah. uh quite obvious that you had yeah. a you know good good presence there um what other sort of stuff do you like to do like in terms of socials do you think that help with retention um yeah well we we run i know like a lot of the guys probably do um we uh run a number of challenges each each year um, yeah. probably probably three to four of varying lengths from you know six week challenges to eight week challenges okay. and we, we usually finish those challenges off with a social day where all the trainers come along the people that went in the challenge potentially their partners obviously this is all outside COVID restrictions um, but yeah even even just members of the gym or people that have done previous challenges that are still in the 
in the system that didn't necessarily do that challenge and we have a social day. So therefore there's sort of two or three really good social days um, associated with that. And then, yeah, like, like you pointed out there, um, we have usually target three or four events across the year where we try and get as many clients and staff involved as we can. You mentioned the Sutherland to Surf, which is the local one. Uh, we do the bridge run as well, um, the, the different events down there, the different distances. Uh, we've done the Canberra one, which is a bit more of a weekend away and then taken a crew down there. So they, they'd be the main, the main things we've done with staff. We've done smaller scale stuff, like some 10 pin bowling days. But to be honest, probably the things that I've found most valuable that people really look forward to is those end of challenge parties, uh, the Christmas parties um, and those big event days where, where people come along and some of them are just supporting. They're not even, um, they're not even going in the actual race. I love that. I love that they come for the social and they, <laughs> they don't even need to do the exercise. That, that's a good culture. Um, when you say like a social day, is it like a barbecue or do you, uh, do you hire a venue and do like a sit down dinner? What, what's your favorite or what, what do you do? Yeah, typically we've hired a space. So uh, it could be like Highfields, we, we, uh, the, the big pub there at Caring Bar, you hired a room there. Um, you know, we've hired a room at the RSL. Uh, depending on the scale of the event, if it's, if it's um, you know, after drinks, after one of the, uh, the runs, sometimes we just arrange to meet at the RSL back in times where you didn't have to scan in and uh, you could go in whatever size group. Um, sure. So there might be 30 or 40 people that meet at the RSL or, or a bar of choice or, or like you said, a restaurant. So it just it just varied. But yeah, probably the ones that were most successful is where we, we specifically hired a space. I love it. I, I think the social stuff makes such a big difference. Um, I, I mentioned Nathan that's got the, the vision in Engadine. He was sharing that they're using, I think he said Kahoot as a a software to do like trivia on Zoom at the moment. So his gym shut like yours. Um, we had 36 people last week uh, log in and take part in some type of trivia. And yeah, whether the gyms are open or closed, everyone's kind of looking for something a bit more than like facilities, aren't they? They sort of mm. love that that connection. And um, yeah, that, that obviously has a, a fair bit to do with why your members stay as long, but also your, your trainers, which is good. Uh, the community thing has been absolutely essential to the to the success of my business. If you if you go to my business, it's it's certainly not um, you know cutting edge facility in terms of what's available in terms of equipment and all that sort of stuff. It's definitely the uh, the community aspect that's um, that's really kept us uh, um, as successful as what we've been. Yeah, it's full full testament to the effort you've put into it. I've got some good questions that have come up. Um, Tim's got the Plus Fitness in WA. He says, um, how do you help trainers to build up their income? Um, are, are they doing their own sales or do you do the sales? How, how does it work to sort of build your, your personal trainers hours up? Um, well, yeah, I mean, their only job, and when we, when we bring them on board, we make it pretty clear that it's the responsibility of the business and the brand to generate the leads. Um, and to, their job is to make sure that they deliver a service that, that warrants, you know, those clients, um, you know, staying medium to long-term clients. So you your know, trainers, uh, I was just going to ask, are they employed like hourly rate or are they rental? They start, they, they work for the business, but they start as, as contractors. Sure. Um, for all intent and purposes, they're treated as full-time employees in the sense that, you know, we cover their workers, comp, their superannuation, their uniform, any any expenses are covered by the business just sure. for payment payment purposes and getting them into the business. They're, they're contractors. As they pass through the different reviews, then then some are put on to, to full-time where they'll have a, a tiered income. So they'll have a variable part of their income and they'll have a fixed part of their income based on some duties that they might have. So that's just a progression that um, I think gives them a little bit more stability and a little bit more motivation just to stay on longer term. Mm. Um, in terms of how do we build up their income? Yeah, I guess step number one is just to work really hand in hand with them to get their sessions up. So, you know, I guess developing them as a trainer to make sure that their attention is really good and giving them good opportunities with, with leads coming in is step number one. Once they've got to a uh, a good level of a uh, good level of, of hours that I think both parties are satisfied with, um, and yeah, you've got to be careful 
not to overload the wrong people, but once you've got to a sort of level that you agree with the person is there full time, whether that's 30 hours of PT and four group training sessions or 25 and five, whatever it is that, that you come up with in conjunction with them. Obviously, the next thing is to give them an opportunity to increase their rate of pay through good work and retention. Sure. Then I think the next step for me is to add different duties. So, for example, um, you know, tap into the strengths and, and the interests of your, of your trainers. I've had, I've had trainers that have been really interested and, and quite skillful at the social side of things. So I've brought them into that into that space and got them involved and paid them a set fee for their contribution to, to social media, which is, you know, taken work away from me and it's given work to them. Um, and it's tapped into their skills. Some of them were, were better than me at, at social media. So, you know, to, to pay them, I think was um, the benefit all parties, the business, the, the, the trainer and myself. Um, there was another, sorry. That's good. It's um, I, I'm just sort of thinking back because you mentioned before, like one of the reasons why they they stay on is because you you know that you can get them enough income for them to stay, so they don't get to six or twelve months and go, ah, oh, fitness industry doesn't pay me enough. So you you make sure that you manage their expectations on how fast it's going to grow. Mm -hmm. I like that you said the business and the brand is responsible for generating most of the inquiries. So mm -hmm. if, if they can focus more of their time on the product and the service, um, they're obvious, you're obviously making money from them, but I like that you actually take some of that onus of, of putting people in front of them, um, you know, as, as, as a business role. Yeah. Um, I also love the one that you're sort of giving them other, other roles because the, they get bored otherwise. Like if, mm. if there's no additional roles, responsibilities or progression, that's another reason why they go, oh, thanks, I've sort of done everything I can here and they, and they still leave. Yeah, definitely. It's good. Um, other questions, uh, Lily's in Victoria, she says, um, do you specifically advertise to build your PTs versus the whole service? So do you run campaigns specifically for like a PT in a challenge or is it always just advertising gym membership and then you try and, um, uh, vertically sort of promote them once they're inside? No, we, we've, I've always promoted them as two separate services. Sure. Um, I, I found that most successful. And, you know, to be honest, you know, one flows into the other, obviously. Um, you know, whenever our PT numbers are good, like we, we have an uptake for a challenge, then our gym memberships tend to go up as well because a good percentage of those people will end up taking uh, up gym memberships. Similarly, when we have a successful um campaign you know promoting memberships it, it has a good positive flow on effect to our pt as well so we do promote them separately i'll have a separate campaigns and social media campaigns that hone in on pt and then i'll have some that are specific to um to the memberships so i've had a couple that are, that are all in one every yep. now and then but um generally speaking I, I try and design my campaign separately and then as i say one tends to flow into the other yeah, it's good. Um, with when you're doing like a promo, um, the gym's obviously shut at the moment in Sydney. But um, do you are you doing like a, a seven day trial? Are you doing like a an opportunity for them to taste test either the gym or a PT? Yeah, we we do offer uh, free trials. Um, yep. We haven't done a lot of camp. We've done some campaigns that have specifically highlighted the free trial offer, but it's it's something we more arm our reception staff and trainers who are actually dealing with the sales to offer yeah. in the sales process. Okay. Um, you know, when they feel like they've sort of got someone half interested, you know, it, it's something in their, their armory to tip them over the line. And yes, yeah. we have used the free offer um, uh, the free trial that that hasn't hasn't worked enormously for us the, the free trial um, it, it hasn't been something that's been super successful it has been successful in where you've got a 50 50 sale tipping them over the line but yeah. as a, there's a straight out campaign it hasn't been something we've we've used a lot um, because it didn't didn't necessarily work for us and our client demographic yeah I, i've sort of found the same um you know, if I think back to 10 years ago as a gym owner, I think the, the free did better. I just think there was less gyms and, and the people sort of saw value in free. And I do like when you can sort of charge them something. I do like when you can get some 
level of sort of commitment there. So I think both can sort of work, but it's it's probably less appealing than ever the the free trial. Um, I, I've sort of acknowledged that same thing. Um, other questions. Sunny said, if if you had the business, uh, if you still own the business, and you've got all the changes happening with like post, uh, pandemic, um, would you keep the model the same? Would you sort of make any changes? Like you you've still got your finger on the pulse. You're still in there. Do you feel like anything needs to change, or what do you think? Uh, well, we you know I've been through this once where we shut down for three months and reopened. So I guess I can answer from that experience and. I guess we were, we were fortunate with our business model that we already did um, quite a bit of outdoor group training. Yep. Um, and I think, you know, the messages through the media, the, the sentiment amongst the public is that in terms of safety, that outdoor training remains the safest of all options. So, you know, we, we had people that were more than happy to race straight back into the gym that weren't, weren't concerned with that at all but there's probably a reasonable percentage of people that maybe still had half a thought about COVID safety and that type of thing. So coming back out of um, the first lockdown and when gyms reopened with some level of restriction, we, we really um, highlighted our outdoor group training options um, okay. and the safety that that provided as a way of getting people back in. Um, uh, no, so look, I think because our model is still very um, heavily weighted in terms of PT and therefore our numbers, you know, like, like you said before, our, our gym numbers are around 400. We do around three, 350 personal training appointments a week. Um, you know, we could play up the space in our gym as well. Our gym's never too overloaded. So um, it didn't require too much tweaking. I think we did really tweak so we really did focus on the steps we were taking in terms of hygiene and cleanliness to give people confidence that they could come back safely. Yeah. Uh, and I think when people came in for the very first time and we had stickers down about spacing and we had, you know, those spray cans everywhere and sanitization stations everywhere, you know, everyone to a person was commenting on how safe they felt coming back into that environment post the lockdown. Sure. To, to answer your question, our model really um, worked well coming out of the first lockdown. And I think because we, we highlighted our outdoor options and we, we sort of kept going with the outdoor PT as well, um, that, that worked really well for us and we bounced back really strongly. Yeah, it's good. It's, um, it, it's, it's kind of managing expectations, isn't it? It's helping people to feel safe and um, yeah, the model's always worked. It's, it's probably more just, um, you might have to acknowledge, you know, in a contract, if someone's, you know, if, if we are locked down because of a pandemic, yeah, I'll have these options, or it might be, you know, um, if someone isn't feeling confident to return to indoor, you give them that outdoor option, but it's largely the same product or service. You've just sort of uh, deliver it with a slightly different sort of um, uh, tint on it. That's good. Uh, I think we're lucky as well because, you know, I guess more than half of our revenue is from is from personal training fees. You've got the weapon of your trainers engaging with people to get them back in as well. You know, trainers that have a rapport with them that can sell the message about, um, you know, the safety of your gym coming back into it. So sure. um, rather than just selling to people that, you, you know, your members who you've got a small connection with, you, you, you're getting your trainers to sell to people that they've got a large connection with. Look, it definitely makes the business a little bit more sturdy having income from different sources. I think you said it was like 60, 40 or something like that. Um, it, it is harder if 99% of your income just comes from memberships. So I like that you've sort of got that option. Um, let's change gears for a second. So um, I, I mentioned before you sold the business. Um, I know you, you're able to sell. You said you're happy with me to share for about half a million dollars, um, which is a, a great little sort of high five and an exit after, you know, making profit in this business for the last 17 years. Um, tell me a bit about that process. Who did you sell to? How did you go about actually creating a sale, particularly last year when, you know, pandemic was as, as bad as it is now? Yeah, well, if I'm being honest, um, it was probably something that was planning in my mind rather than something I initially, uh, that, that I initiated. Um, you know, I'd had a few approaches over the years inquiring as to whether I was interested in selling. Um, one came, or the, 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 the one that was most important came probably 
uh, just a few months before COVID was a thing, actually. And it was probably the first time I thought, um, you know, may, maybe this is my opportunity to, to sort of cash in, I guess. And, um, you know, I've been at it for 17 years. I've loved it. Still enjoy it. But, um, you know, if the offer was right, it could be the right time. So sure. uh, it probably started with an interested party and just engaging with them and them sort of learning a little bit more about the business. Um, and from that, from that point forward there, so it, before, you know, figures were spoken about or, you know, even I was certain that I wanted to sell it, it probably came over a few coffee meetings with the interested party where they sort of asked how the business model worked. Um, you know, I, in that time, I was convincing myself that it was my time to sell. Um, and then it sort of progressed from there to, to getting a little bit more serious, I think as I spoke to the prospective buyer about the business model and they knew a little bit about it, obviously, which is why they approached. But as we got a bit deeper into it and they got more interested, um, then it started to get a bit more serious. And then um, from that point, you know, at no stage did I advertise it. At no stage did I make it widely known that I was selling the business. I didn't want to destabilize anything during the process. Yeah, um, good. Obviously that can reduce your value um, if you start to destabilize during that process. So. Um, you know, I spoke to a few people um, that I thought might also be interested at that time just to let them know, people that had maybe given me a little tap before. I had one staff member that had always said he'd be interested to either buy in as a, as a part owner or a complete owner when the day came. Um, and I also had my, my tenant to consider as well. So once it got a little bit more serious, I, I sort of mentioned it to a couple of other people and then all of a sudden I had three interested parties to um, to negotiate with. What's what's the advantage of having more than one potential buyer, do you think? Uh, I think it creates, um, well, not, not desperation, but um, it certainly puts you in the driver's seat in terms of negotiation when there's three interested parties, because, uh, you know, obviously you can be, uh, you can you can push your side of things a little bit more when you've got three people on the line than you could with one person through fear of losing that that one opportunity if you're really set on it. Um, but yeah, I guess the fact that um, they approached me put me in a pretty reasonable position. But um, yeah, definitely having three parties was was beneficial. I felt comfortable that one of them was going to buy it at the price that I was sort of pushing for. Yep. Uh, at all times and that that sort of helped me as well it's good it's um you know it's a smooth transition because you can hand it to someone that you know is going to look after your staff and your members because you've done a, those coffee things and it's not just going out to a random who wants an investment um i like the fact that with a couple of people actually looking at it it doesn't it's not just all talk i i think everyone needs a house and i think they'll go and buy a house and there's heaps of people in the market to buy a house but I don't actually reckon there's that many people. If you went around Cronulla, I don't reckon you could more find more than like a handful or two of people that want or, or could actually run the gym. Um, you know, so it's, um, you definitely, um, you, you, by sifting through and finding like real buyers and genuine mm -hmm. buyers, it sort of makes that, that process easier. Um, when I sold my first gym, I'd been there for eight years. So the reason I was selling similar to yours, I just wanted to change. Um, at the same time, we had a second person that was interested and all of a sudden the first one moved ahead and it sold in like 30 days. Mm -hmm. Without the second one, everyone's looking at it going, well, what's wrong with this business? But like your business, my business, they're making good money. It's a, it was an actual good acquisition. But mm -hmm. the fact that they're the only person looking almost gives them fear and they think, why does no yeah. one else want to buy it? Yeah. I love that you sort of not only had two, but there was a couple of interested parties there. Mm. Um, you said that you organised a little bit of a handover process, but you're obviously still in there now. What what was your original arrangement before sort of COVID changed or extended things? Did you say, you know, I'll help out a certain number of hours, a certain number of months? What was your yeah, well, the, the, term? The, um, the buyer wasn't someone who was currently running or had experience in this type of business model. So... Um, he asked and uh, if I'd be interested in a sort of six to eight month handover period where I could basically, you know, pick, pick my hours within reason, um, sure. just to make that a smooth handover period, uh, which I, which I was happy to do, you know, obviously when you invest 17 years in a business, um, yeah, it's obviously a business transaction and you want to make money out of it, but I've got a lot of connections in that business 
in terms of the staff that I've developed, in terms of, you know, clients that have become long-term friends. So to know that uh, the, the transition and the handover was going to be smooth and the business was going to move forward. And obviously, when someone's been really good in the negotiation process and, and um, you know, they seem a good person, you want them to have success with the business as well and you want the business to live on. Yeah. So it was, it was a no-brainer for me to, to, you know, to put in a, you know, six, six seven, eight months at a scale down um, level where, you know, I could basically pick my hours, which I said, you know, I'd be happy to do 20 to 25 hours a week. And I was, um, or, yeah, probably 20 hours a week. And I was confident that I could have uh, quite an impact for him. Turns out I probably am not even doing that. Um, but I think what I'm, you know, I'm teaching him the ropes and I've, you know, probably um, reduced the anxiousness of the staff and the clients to know that the, the, tr the transition and the handovers going to be ability smooth, and they're going to continue to get what they've gotten for the last you know 10 15 years it's good it's um obviously with with that bio without the experience it, it, it's really valuable I, I think for my one it was able to go a bit quicker simply because it was an existing gym owner that knew the model and didn't really need me around yeah. um i i think uh yeah i think that's really cool um let's change gears again um you mentioned before um Sometimes your staff are looking for ways that they can sort of add another skill or get paid for something else. You said that you actually have one of your staff that's quite handy when it comes to social media. So instead mm -hmm. of sort of outsourcing to an agency or a company, you're actually paying someone internally to help out with social media. How, how does that work? How, do you, how did you set that up? What do you pay? How many hours? What do you do? Yeah, so I set them, I, I give them a set fee, which was, um, I think the starting when he first started, it was it was five hundred dollars a month on top of his his wage, so yep. it was a, you know it was a modest a modest starting point. But um, you know I wanted to give him the opportunity and see what he could contribute, and then um, you know move it up from there. So I, I would sit down with him and we would make a sort of like a a rough monthly strategy of what we wanted to promote, the messages that we want to get across. Great. And then um, it was his job to go out there and you know, source the images and get the content together. Um, he, he'd run by his weekly plan with me. I would approve it. And then he would go and do all the posting and all that type of thing. So They're great. part of his job was also to, you know, go and go and look at what other people were doing as well. So to be sur surfing uh, social media and um, sure. seeing what's going on out there and, and bringing some new ideas to the table. And it's, it's not a lot of money, like 100, 125 bucks a week um for for a role that like you can't do everything in these businesses at that size there's just so many hours in the day and you can't do it all so yeah. you would sort of have a bit of an idea and recommend stuff around what's the offer or promotion going to be and then you'd come up with a bit of a plan together as to how you would roll it out whether it's email yeah. or facebook it was yeah. his job to actually implement it yeah. um do you know roughly like how many hours he he would spend do you sort of know what he would in, put into it each week well, I always said to him, and we didn't base it on hours, we based it on outcomes, you know, the, the quality of what he was doing and the reach, okay. that, it was, the reach that it was getting um, and the impact that it was having. So it was more based around that. But in the initial stages, I guess I gave him an idea and said, look, my expectation is you'll spend two and a half hours on this a week um, in, in planning and gathering information and researching. That would be a minimum starting point, would be to spend two and a half hours on it a week. Plus, plus the small meeting that he had with me. And yep. then, you know, it was down to him and his productivity and how efficient he could be and how effective he could be. It's good. It's like I, I do the lead generation and, and implement that stuff in, in my gym. Uh, because we're closed, it's, it's cheaper than ever to buy leads and get like inquiries through. So my hours have actually dropped down recently. So again, it's outcome based for me. I love the idea that it's outcome based for them as well. If if it's going slow and you're not getting a lot of inquiries, just roll mm. up the sleeves and do a little bit more, change things up a bit. If it's going great, spend an hour on it. I don't care as long as the leads are coming through. That that that's really strong. Yeah, yeah. Um, tell us a bit about your time management. Um, I I, I know you're married. I know you've got kids. Tell us a bit about like your wife. Uh, she's obviously got her own career You've, uh, how old are the kids how do you sort of um yeah what's life look like outside of uh owning a gym um you mean for the period that i was that, that i was the owner no i just mean like I, I think for most of us um 
there's other stuff like we like to train for events we we've i've got two kids and i'm married like the fitness is part of it but like tell us a bit about your life outside of um you know just running the gym over the last 17 years what what's it look like at home yeah, well, I've got two kids. Um, one's 15, one's 12. Uh, so they're, um, you know, in the last couple of years started to got, get a whole lot more independent uh, in a lot of ways. Um, still have to run them around quite a bit to their sports. They both play a couple of sports. So, yeah, my wife uh, works in an executive role where she has to uh, put in some pretty big hours. So she has to drive, you know, a fair way to work and from work. So I probably get the lion's share of dropping kids to and from, um, you know, daily sports activities and et cetera, or she sure, has a sure. job. But fortunately, um, I'd created the flexibility to be able to do that. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're a pretty active household. Um, you know, I like to train for events like uh, marathons, half marathons. So, uh, again, I've been able to, to factor that into to my lifestyle. I, I just sort of blocked um, hours that I committed to the business each day. And then outside of that, I was able to um, undertake things that I wanted to undertake and, and things that I needed to do with the kids. Uh, and I've been very lucky to, um, to travel extensively over the last 10 years as well. I've probably spent uh, outside of COVID times, maybe six to eight weeks a year overseas um, in Europe um, and other parts of the world. So uh, again, fortunately the business has been um, good enough to, to be able to do without me for those chunks each year and, and be able to, to, to get that travel under my belt. And I think ultimately that's, that's what everyone on the call is looking to do is not only like help more members get fit and strong or whatever, but it's to, to make good money from it, have an asset that at some point someone would offer to sort of buy it from us, but, but have a bit of a life. Like you're, it's, um, if you're in the gym seven days a week and you're trying to, manage it and do the sales and do all the lead generation it's it's pretty tiring um so I, I love the fact that you sort of found a bit of a balance there like tracy's i think you said worth six days and a very successful career herself at the same time you've got a really good team and you've got systems in place so it means that you um you don't have to be in there all the time doing everything oh 100 and um you know also i know we're going to maybe talk a little bit more about the sale but that's what you need to do if you want to have something that's sellable. What, are, what areas of your business have you sort of um, improved over the years? Like you've had it for 17 years. There must have been time or money invested along the way. Like what, what's paid off for you? Uh, a few things. Um, the change in approach and, and our, I guess with our business model, we've been able to have a functioning reception staff which um, is operating on all the hours that we're open um, and that's a courtesy of the you know the PT appointments that we have three to 350 of those the fact that we've got a retail shop there where we sell some coffee we've able to able to have 24/7 um, reception um, so that um, that, that's, that's been really good. So they, they basically deal with most of our sales and sales training was, was something that became increasingly important, particularly as we moved into the, the membership space um, and particularly as gyms started popping up around. Um, you know, in the early years, it was a case of you, you, give, you give them a little bit of um, information and they don't have a whole lot of other options. So you, you, you have a fair chance of getting them in as a member. Um, yep. Whereas now, obviously, it's super, super, super competitive, probably everywhere, but particularly in our area, close to the coast of Cronulla. So you can't just give them uh, information and expect you're going to convert them all into, you know, members or PT clients. So um, putting putting resources into sales training, um, and you know, I know we we used you for that, and we've used a couple of other means as well, and that that has been super important to. Um, in, the, in the membership space to increase our conversion rate of memberships. Obviously, um, you know, you've, you've got someone helping out uh, and outsourcing or insourcing some social media and stuff. But even if that person's doing a great job, if you've got lots of leads coming in, if you're sort of wasting those because, you know, your staff just don't have the skills, it, it, it is a bit of a waste of money. So yeah, that, yeah. that's good. Um, anything you sort of like you've had a good career in the fitness industry um, anything you wish you kind of knew in the early days or mistakes you've made that you've learned from 
Um, oh yeah, plenty, plenty of mistakes. Uh, I think, I, I think in the early days, um, we weren't real sure about what our target market was, um, and that probably is a bit of a giveaway with our with our training name. And you know, if you if you go back to our original name, it was Elite Personal Training and Sports Coaching. So on the one hand, we're offering you know personal training to the to the public, and we're also trying to capture a that sort of elite um, athlete sort of market, which we, we, we did a bit of, but um, yeah, and we weren't, weren't really, I wasn't really sure of what the market was that I needed to, to target and probably wasted a lot of marketing time with uh, ineffective marketing campaigns because I didn't really fully understand who my um, client demographic or my client avatar was. Sure. Um, so, you know, that took a few years to learn and, and sort of really nail in on that. And then obviously that just streamlined my marketing, gave me a really good understanding of what was going to be successful um, with marketing campaigns in the early days. So I'd say that's probably that. And, and as mentioned, this, the sales approach is, is a big one, you know, like just thinking you're going to give information and people are going to stroll on in. Um, that was a big change as well. But I, I would say, yeah, definitely you know, the understanding of your client demographic and, and your client avatar and then marketing accordingly, I think would have seen my business build up a lot, a lot faster. It's, it's so good. It's, um, it's obviously a, a product and a service that people have probably enjoyed from the early days, but yeah, your, your ability to sort of get sharper at some of the uh, positioning with your marketing, your ability to sort of convert more of the inquiries that come through that's obviously like very well connected to how many clients a PT gets and whether they stay, it's very, it's directly related to whether or not you have to be in there kind of 12 hour days. Um, so mate, well done. It's been really good. I just want to quickly go around the grounds guys. Um, we've covered a lot today. We've talked about uh, retention. Um, Cameron spoke about, he's had trainers for like four trainers for over 10 years. Uh, we've spoken about the sale process and how he was able to sell last year with a couple of different interested parties. I'm, I'm interested to see if you've got any questions before we let him uh, dart off and, and watch the highlights of the Olympics. Um, mm -hmm. Go into the chat. Tell me if you've got any uh, questions for us. Um, Cameron, this has been fantastic. I, um, I'm really excited to let everyone know who's on the call as well. Um, I'm actually organising for Cameron to come in a couple of hours a week and be available for one-on-ones uh, moving forward. Um, we've been fortunate enough to have uh, John Rami for the, the last kind of two years or so. And as his uh, number of hours increase with Dembley and sort of diving in uh, more full-time into that, um, I wanted to make sure we had someone with a bit of experience involved. So um, yeah, as of next week, Cameron's got a couple of hours a week, which will also go into the calendar. Maybe there was something about the retention, the sale or something that's been covered today that you feel like relates to your, your business. Um, so yeah, I look forward to sort of getting you involved in that as, as we go ahead as well. No, definitely looking forward to it, mate. Enjoy it. A um, couple of quick questions before we race off. Gene, Alessi, uh, how did you value the business? Was it a multiple of profit? Did you just pluck a number out of your head? Did they offer the number how did you come up with it yeah so I, I went to my accountant to get a valuation done by my accountant and he yep. is quite qualified to do that my understanding is not every single uh accountant out there knows how to value a business but it comes back to that ebitda um that ebitda formula that they use which is basically sure. um steve you'll, you'll know about that that ebitda as well but it's a formula they use to come up with what the value of the business is yeah um, so you, so you essentially, um, I, I found, I, I, I got it like three years of my last year's P&Ls um, and then you give it to your accountant if you want to try and value it. Sometimes someone buying it doesn't really believe your valuation of it, so they might want to get their own evaluation or their own accountant. It's, 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 but it's worthwhile. You have a figure in your head and you know what's, uh, what, what you would take for it. I think what's yeah. really interesting is... Um, some people have a, a business that's really good business and it's a great opportunity. And the reason you're selling it's totally legit, but it is priced so ridiculously high because a broker or someone's just lied to you as to what it's actually worth. So I think for yourself and, and me, like we, with, with our, our sales examples, we're actually able to get a result where both parties were happy. It was actually good and it moved through pretty quick because it was actually priced like uh, fairly. So I sort of encourage you guys to go through that process. Um, 
yes, with my P and Ls, like I'd been putting through stuff in through my business uh, for years, which didn't necessarily needed to be put through there. So if I buy my wife a bunch of flowers, or if I put a flight to Los Angeles there, technically that was going through my 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 tax. However, the new owner doesn't necessarily need to fly to Los Angeles every year in the business. So you can do your little ad backs. Let's yeah. say there was 150 grand worth of profit in there. By the time you put back all the things that you didn't actually have to put through there, the, the business might show $200,000 of annual profit. And then you can sort of get a, an EBITDA or a, a, an estimate of that. But um, in, in answer to your question, Gene, I, I'm seeing businesses sell for two to 2.5 times EBITDA at the moment. Um, and the only exception to that is when there's just a super passionate person that trains in the gym that falls in love with it and they pay something over that. So that, that still happens. Um, yes, and I, I, to add on to that, Steve, my, my accountant, yeah, had a similar formula. So he worked out the EBITDA, which is income before tax and amortization. And um, yeah, you got your ad back. So you've got your wage, whatever you were paying yourself, you add back into your, to your net profit. Yeah, stuff you're putting through the business that you that are really nothing to do with the business. You put <laughs> you, you put back in like my six to eight weeks overseas a year where I don't think I saw a gym but claimed it. Um, back in to come up with your EBITDA figure and then you times it by three. My understanding is that you times that by three, that's your best result. Um, yep according to the textbook and then for example my negotiation was he come in and he wanted to pay to start with he wanted to pay 2.5 times EBITDA so we had to yep. negotiate from there it's it's always good um Gene if you can have a little bit of leeway so I I, I never sort of I would advertise it the because everyone wants to have a bit of a win um so yeah if you want to sell for for 400 maybe started at 450 or something like that just so there's a little bit of wiggle room so everyone feels like they're they're a winner um other questions how do you train up inexperienced pts do you hire anyone that's sort of raw or are you getting them that with a bit of experience and, and what what do you do to get them up to the speed no uh, well, we, we've had both over the journey people that are reasonably fresh um we, we have an induction training um, which for, for an inexperienced PT will definitely be longer um, where we've got a staff manual and we basically work through that staff manual, which depending on the person's qualifications and experience will determine the length and the depth of that. But um, pretty much it's a sort of a three day type thing and it, it can be structured to suit the person coming in. If they've still got finishing up other work, um, you move it around, but it's basically what would work out as a, as a three day sort of induction training. And then it finishes by just shadowing some of your senior staff, both in a group training setting and a personal training setting to see your systems and processes actually in action. I love that. I've, I've seen others that do like two hours a week over eight weeks. I, I love the idea of like three more intensive days where you get someone up to speed, maybe capable of bringing in some dollar productive hours earlier. That, that's great. Mm. Very good. Hey, listen, guys, I'm very conscious of Cameron's time. You've um, gone over and above just like pulling back the curtains on what's worked and the stuff that hasn't. And um, yeah, thank you so much for your, your time today. Absolute pleasure, mate. Enjoyed it. Um, guys, quick reminder, I will um, add Cameron to our um, members Facebook group. Um, his uh, schedule will open up for two hours uh, from next week onwards to to handle one-on-ones if anyone wants to sort of ask a little bit more about that i um, obviously available to, to book in with myself as well for one-on-ones but um yeah thank you so much um be sure to uh reach out and say good day to cameron as well uh in the network thanks guys enjoy the rest thanks of your guys day. all the best all the best